let's take a look now at the second version of the fundamental theorem. It looks an awful lot like the first version. It doesn't quite say the same thing, but we often sort of confound them as being part of the same theorem. Here we're looking at things in the other direction. So we assume that we have a function from AB to R. This function is again Riemann integrable. And we define a new function, capital F, uppercase F, which will also go from AB to R by x being associated by the integral of little f from a to x. So here we're showing you how to build the antiderivative of the function. This construction yields a continuous function on a b. And furthermore, if f is continuous on the interval a b, and C at some point somewhere between A and B, then F is differentiable. Let's say F here, I mean the antiderivative that we've built, F. Let's see with the derivative of big F being equal to small f. Notice something here. I have to add this statement assuming that f is continuous and something happens. The fact that little f is Riemann integrable doesn't mean that it's continuous, right? There are Riemann integrable functions that are not continuous. In order for this function here to really be an antiderivative, you need to have that the little function f is continuous on the integral. So what do we need to show? Well, we need to show, first of all, that the function uppercase f is continuous, and then the second thing we need to show is that if on top of that little f is continuous, then the derivative of big F will be little f. So let's start by showing that big F is continuous. Since f is Riemann integrable on AB, we know, amongst other things, that it has to be bounded. not bounded, it cannot be Riemann integral. It's possible that the improper integral would exist, but in terms of how we've defined Riemann integrability, we need an upper bound and a lower bound for the function on each subinterval of the partition. And if the function isn't bounded either above or below, then the lower bound or the upper bound does not exist, and we cannot build the Riemann sums, and everything else sort of falls apart. So the function has to be bounded on AB if it is integral. So let k be that bound, and say be a bound. So the absolute value of f at x is smaller than k for every x in the interval. Now we show that this function f has to be continuous. So let x be a specific point in epsilon be greater than zero. If we want to prove continuity, we're going to use the epsilon delta definition. In essence, we need to show that f at y minus f at x will be smaller than epsilon whenever x minus y is smaller than delta epsilon, which will mean that the function uppercase f is uniformly continuous on the interval. But because the interval is closed and bounded, if it's uniformly continuous, it is also continuous, right? So this is what we want to show. Set delta epsilon to the epsilon over the bound k. Then for any x and y, which is such that the distance between x and y is smaller than delta epsilon, we will have f at y minus f at x is equal, what is it equal to? We know that by definition, capital F is the integral of the function f 
from a to y, that's by definition, minus the integral of the function f from a to x. And now we use the properties of the Riemann integrals to know, to notice that this is exactly the same as the absolute value of the integral of f from x to y, right? If you remember, when you have a negative sign here, you can switch this to a plus by switching the bounds. It gives you what you want. Interval from x to a, and then from a to y, that's just the interval from x to y. Now we know that the function f is bounded, and so the integral of f from x to y is going to have to be smaller than k times y minus x. I'm not sure that y is always going to be greater than x, so just put it between absolute bounds. Now technically speaking, this is due to theorem 55. The fact that you can put the absolute value. This was a theorem talking about this type of stuff. It might not be numbered 55 in Aaron's slides. But look, when x minus y in absolute value is smaller than delta epsilon, this thing here is going to be smaller than k times delta epsilon, and delta epsilon is exactly equal epsilon over k, these things cancel, we're left with epsilon. So whenever x minus y, or y minus x in absolute value, is smaller than delta epsilon, whenever x and y are very close to one another, within delta epsilon of one another, then you can guarantee that f at y minus f at x will be very close as well. Hence, f is uniformly continuous. The interval a b and so by definition f is continuous so we've shown the first half of what we had to show when we build a function like this using the Riemann integral the function that we build is continuous now if we further assume that the function f is continuous the little f is continuous then it turns out that this function big f is in fact differentiable and f prime at c will be little f at c. And I remind you that is not always going to be the case. If it is continuous on a b though, little function f, we show that f prime at c would be little f at c for all c's in the interval a. We need to show differentiability, we use the definition. Let epsilon be greater than zero. Because f is continuous by assumption here, little f, at c, you'll be able to find some delta epsilon positive such that f at x minus f at c is smaller than epsilon over 2 whenever x minus c is smaller than delta epsilon and x is in the interval a. Typically, we write this as smaller than epsilon. But look, I'm just saying I'm using a different epsilon. I'm going to call it eta, say. That eta is going to be half of the original epsilon. So I'll work with this eta, find the delta eta that works with this one. And then at the end of the day, just replace my eta by epsilon over 2. Gives you the same kind of deal. Basically, when x and c are close enough to one another, f at x minus f at c will be close enough to one another. You're specifying the degree of closeness that I'm talking about. And we pick, assuming that c is an a, b, an h, such that c plus h is also in the interval a, b. And we're going to compute the absolute value the following difference. On the left we have the differential quotient and on the right we have the candidate for the derivative. So if big F is differentiable, let's see, and if the derivative of big F is little f, then this quantity here should be as small as we want whenever x and c are close enough together. I want to show that this is smaller than epsilon whenever x and c are within delta epsilon one another. 
Now we know what this capital F is. We've built it in the statement of the theorem. This would be the integral from A to C plus H of the function F. Now, typically I don't write the dependence on the variable, but here I will divide that by H minus 1 over H again times the integral from A to C the function ft with respect to t minus f at c. So I've just rewritten what the differential quotient here is using the definition of big F, how we've defined it in the statement of the theorem. The first part gives me, well, there's 1 over h, which I will put uh, in front of the integral. And now I'm integrating from a to c plus h, and I'm subtracting what happens between a and c, I'm left with the integral between c and c plus h of the function. And now, because f at c is a constant, I can also integrate it over c, c plus h. But now I'm integrating with respect to t. So f at c is this constant, and if I want to get f at c, I have to divide by h. This expression here is exactly the same as this one, but I've written it in a format that will allow me to combine the integrands together. Make sure you understand why this is the case. This would be 1 over h times the integral from c to c plus h of ft minus c with respect to t. I can take the 1 over h out, and I'm left with the integral c, c plus h, ft minus f at c, with respect to t. All this in absolute value. Now we've seen that the absolute value of an integral has to be smaller than or equal to the integral the absolute value. And we've seen further that f at t minus f at c is smaller than epsilon over t whenever x minus c is smaller than delta epsilon. So we get this expression. Because t and c are close enough, eventually, I specified it, but to make sure that it is close enough, and the definition here, we need to have c plus h minus c smaller than delta epsilon. Then f at t minus f at c will actually be smaller than epsilon over 2. We're close enough to where we need to be. And now that leaves me with 1 over h times epsilon over 2 times the integral of 1 between c and c plus h with respect to t. That's h. These cancel out. But I put epsilon over 2, which is smaller. So now, if my points are close enough, so if I pick points close enough to C, C plus H, for instance, within delta epsilon from one another, then the difference between this expression, F at C plus H minus F at C divided by H, and F at C is going to be smaller than epsilon. So this difference quotient can be made to approach F at C with an arbitrary degree of precision. We conclude from there, f prime at c, f at c.